Statistics and Operations Research. The first part of this lecture will cover what you need to know to be able to run the statistics regression assignment. The assignment is on Moodle. The data set for the assignment is also located on Moodle. The example I'm giving you is not related to strategic studies, but is a much simpler model so that you understand what it is. Following the statistics comes the operations research. The extended linear regression procedure. So previously we looked at a simple linear regression by hand, which is a bivariate a relationship, a single independent variable. Now we're going to extend that into a linear regression with multiple independent variables done by SPSS, which is one of the statistical software packages available for making this kind of analysis. So this technique, which is also known as ordinary least squares regression, is at the heart of making predictions in political science. It's the most common technique. I'd say about three quarters of all techniques use this um, uh, particular uh, mathematical application. The two things we're looking for are a prediction equation and the indicator of the proportion of the variance explained, which is an R squared. It tells us how much of the outcome in the dependent variable is predicted by the uh, uh, independent variables. And this is very important. It tells us how powerful the model that we've created is. Now just to uh, uh, restate uh, um, earlier information, there's three different kinds of statistics. There are of course descriptive statistics, uh, which are simply uh, quantitative description, uh, how many of something there are. Then there's correlational statistic. Uh, is there a relationship between do uh, two variables. For example, does the presence of an authoritarian government rather than, say, a democracy make certain policy outcomes more likely than others? Uh, normally, the measures of association range between minus one to plus one, where a minus is an inverse relationship, where as one value goes up, the other value goes down, uh, or the reverse. Um, so one would indicate a hundred percent of the variance explained. Most values in the social sciences range up to about 0.5 or 0.6. Any, any value higher than that, higher than 0.6 or 0.7, higher than 70%, uh, makes, you, you know, makes you a little bit suspicious because social scientific phenomenon is so, is so complex and so diverse and there's so many factors at play simultaneously. Um, the decision makers, uh, uh, you know, aside from being overwhelmed, scholars who analyze decision makers, there, there's just so many variables to disentangle that uh, you're not going to get a, 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 a very high um, uh, correlation. Uh, so typically correlations can be described as for a one unit change in x, x is the independent variable, uh, that we would expect a certain specified expected change in the y, which is the dependent variable. So. Uh, that's what we're going to be looking for. And the third kind of statistic is inferential statistics, where we verify whether a result is significant, meaning whether it's a false positive or whether it's a genuine relationship, which is important because we want to be able to generalize from the sample uh, to the population. Otherwise, uh, we have no generalizability of our model. We're simply describing something, and we're not uh, making a statement about a class of things, which is what we want to do as social scientists. So you see here before you the uh, SPSS program uh, as it's opened up. You know, a couple of general rules. You want to save frequently. You've got to make backups. Also, SPSS is a little bit cantankerous. Uh, it doesn't like sharing programs. Very often, uh, students will be uh, using Excel to format their uh, data and then they'll try to open the same file in SPSS without first closing Excel and occasionally you end up with a jam up. So uh, close, close whatever application is using your data file before you bring it in to uh, SPSS. Now there's different uh, uh, parts. This here is the uh, data window. Uh, I'm going to show you the output window which is uh, going to show you the results when you run the uh, statistics. There's also a syntax window where you could uh, delve into code, which we're going to have to do for at least one of the applications. So the first thing we're going to do is get the uh, data. And this data is accessible to you on the website. Okay, so we're going to get some data here. 
And so the data we're going to get is helping save. Data, there we go. So here we have uh, helping save. And you click OK. SPSS will open Excel files. Uh, it'll open a whole variety of fi files, uh, tab delimited, comma delimited, but you have to tell it. It does have a smart capacity to recognize certain formats. Uh, the most frequent importation you'll be doing from another format is from Excel. And the only, uh, the only bit of advice there is when you import it, allow SPSS to take the top line of Excel and to import it as, an, as a series of names. Uh, because if you look at an Excel file, uh, very often you'll have on the, on the very top uh, row, you'll have names of each of the columns, which are the variables, and you want to preserve that. And SPSS will preserve it. It'll, it'll reformat into SPSS. So uh, the, the specific uh, option is read variable names. names. All right, and allow it, allow it to do that. So let's open this up. So this is the uh, variable view. You can see there's variables, uh, rather the data view. You can see the, the, the variable names on the top. The ruler means it's an interval level value, which means they're real numbers going from minus infinity to uh, positive infinity, uh, where uh, you could also have a ranking type of uh, data structure where you'd have bronze, silver, gold type of ranking without specified distances between each of those values. Uh, and then, of course, you could have categorical, which would be you know what city you're born in, where there's no implied ranking. Now, if you're getting your own data, which uh, you will for uh, your own paper, uh, it's always better to get interval level data. Always better. It's the richest uh, type of data. It's got the most information. It'll give you the, the best significance and the most detailed uh, results as far as the correlations go. So we refer to data where we've got many different cases as cross-sectional. When we have data that's across time, we call that longitudinal. So time series, of course, is going to use longitudinal data. But sometimes you have both types of data together. And that's been called a pooled time series, where you've got a number of different countries, and each of the countries is across time. And so it's a fairly complicated setup. You have to use dummy variables to indicate the different uh, countries. But it's um, uh, some kind of uh, tests require it. So you also have uh, here the variable view. It'll give you the uh, variable and um, you can format here the width of the of the cell, its alignment, and other uh, aesthetic um, uh, editors. So the uh, essentially in the data editor you have here a spreadsheet. The rows are going to be the cases. So here you've got case number 10 and your columns are going to be the variables. So these are the uh, different common values for each of the different cases. So um, just to go over it again, we've got four kinds of data. You've got your nominal level, which is uh, an event. There's also a dummy variable. A dummy variable is a variable which is coded as 0 or 1, typically 0 for absence and 1 for the presence of some characteristic. It's very often used for gender or the presence or absence of nuclear weapons or the presence or absence of some major factor. And it's, it sounds rather peculiar, but the, the, the way the math works is that the dummy variable is like a sponge. If in the data you have a relationship which uh, would be detectable if you had a dummy variable and you put a dummy variable in. The process of the math detects that variation and will empower the dummy variable um, with, with value. Now, if, there, if there's no relationship in there, the dummy variable won't be significant. Um, but it's, if you think there is a, a, a key event or a key process that is present, you include a dummy variable, it will soak up those values. Very often, dummy variables are used for post or pre measures of an event. You could have uh, an economy, uh, for example, in the 1930s, and then uh, when war breaks out, uh, you could have a dummy variable that will soak up the processes that change before and after that event. You can use this also as, a, as an intervention, 
where you have uh, a social process and then there's a change of institutions and the dummy variable will, will collect the uh, variation or the change that occurs between the two stages. Now there's also a, 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 a variable called an interaction term and there are instances where the combination of two independent variables together create a disproportionate effect on an outcome. And you can think of uh, the interaction between say an institution and uh, an, an economic depression where in the absence of the institution the economic depression um, you know, is, is, a, is a normal business cycle event with unemployment and slowdowns in the economy and uh, deflation in the prices. But you could uh, imagine that if it intersects with a political uh, institution that encourages uh, political extremism, that it can cause a change in foreign policy. So interaction terms are created by taking two variables and multiplying them together and creating a new variable. Now this sounds rather crude, but it's been shown uh, consistently that it's able uh, to capture in, in, an, in an easy formulation the disproportionate effect of two variables interacting, in addition to the fact that you'd have those two variables already in your equation. Uh, and then of course you have your ordinal level data. Uh, in international relations we have something called the MID, the Militarized Interstate Dispute and uh, they use a hostility level of five levels um, and so which goes from no militarized action to war and various levels of threat in between so that's a very commonly used um, uh, type of uh, data and it's ordinal because we don't we don't have a specified interval between each of the different stages uh, in that uh, variable we just know that five is war one is non-militarized uh, interaction and then there are gradations in between because very often you're not going to be able to measure uh, those types of interactions with a huge amount of detail anyway. And finally, there's the interval level data. The length of the war, the number of casualties, uh, the level of inflation. Um, now for your paper, you have to have three independent variables. And the, they, they of course cannot all be dummy variables. They, they should be predominantly interval level of, of values if those can be found and if what you're studying allows you to do that kind of, of analysis. Always seek interval level data. Uh, it's the richest. Never reduce data. If you have uh, a, a, da a data set and it includes the ages of the people, don't collapse it like you see in a census where you know you're, you're you're, you categorize people from uh, into different groups. Group 1 would be ages 1 to 10, group 2 would be 11 to 20, group 3 would be 21 to 30. Don't ever do that. You lose the richness of the data. It impairs the ability of the statistical um, models to give you the best possible analysis. So it's, it's, it's sometimes done uh, in order to simplify data for readers and observers who, if they get a full range of every age group. They might be somewhat confused, but uh, it's it's not recommended. Uh, it it really undermines the operation of the statistics. Now you can also have uh, indices, another type of uh, variable where you uh, data has been transformed or combined. Um, natural logarithms are frequently used uh, because they incorporate a declining marginal effect. Um, moving averages are sometimes useful. This is where you would collect data before an event, after an event, and during the event, and then take the average of that. And it smooths out the ups and downs, which can be quite jagged uh, from a week to week or month to month when you do an analysis. Um, you can divide the data by the standard deviation to control for uh, variances. So there's uh, you know, different type of indices that you could construct, but the rawest data is almost always the best. So let's take a look at the data set we have here. Uh, here we go down and we can see that we have uh, 81 cases and we've got uh, 20 separate variables. And this uh, data set was used to examine how people help each other. So the specific model of interest that we're focused on is we want to know how people's feelings towards other people affect whether they help them. 
Okay, so let's uh, define some of the variables we're going to be looking at. We're going to be picking some variables out of this uh, data set uh, in order to run our model. Now, this information was presumably acquired through a survey of 81 people, although I think this data set was manufactured by uh, uh, IBM for SPSS. So first we have uh, Zulu help. Whenever we put Z in front of a variable, it means we're normalizing it. Normalizing it means we're taking raw values and we're converting them to standard deviations above or below a mean. So we're taking uh, disparate data and then we're characterizing it as a bell curve with an average or a mean and then uh, deviations from that mean. Uh, uh, you know, however, standard deviations um, from the mean. So if you're one standard deviation below the mean, the data point would be valued at minus one. If you're one standard deviation above the mean, it would be plus one. If you're two standard deviations above the mean, it would be plus two. So it takes data and, and translates it directly into uh, deviations, standard deviations. So we have here uh, Zulu help, which is a normalized. We, when, when you z-score something and you turn it into a bell curve, a normal bell curve, we call it normalized. Uh, it's the amount of time spent helping, helping a friend on a minus three to plus three scale. Now sympathy, uh, which is the first independent variable, is sympathy felt by a helper in response to a friend, friend's need, and it goes from little, which is valued at one, to much, valued at seven. So you can see these are not interval, they're, they're ordinal, but they're, they've got so many levels in them, seven levels, that they're almost interval, and, and SPSS would treat it, ordinary least squares regression would treat it as interval. But it's still not optimal, and it's not genuine interval level data. The second independent variable is anger. It's anger felt by the helper in response to a friend's need, again on a seven point scale. We have efficacy. Uh, uh, which is which is self-efficacy. It's the ability of the helper in relation to a friend's need. It's a seven-point scale. And finally, we have D sex, a D for dummy. So this is a gender variable, and it varies between one for female and zero for male. Now, uh, curious thing about the math, uh, you could reverse it. You could have female zero, male one. The way it works out in the math, if you remember the prediction equation, is the coefficient is going to be zero if you're male and one if you're female. So zero times uh, the variable is going to make the variable disappear. And so it's going to take male out of the of the equation. And then you can calculate your dependent variable, your predicted value, your, your y hat. Uh, if it's female, it'll be one times the coefficient. Now, you could have a dummy variable where instead of choosing one and zero, you could choose 258 and 9,000 right for female and male and it's going to produce the exact same result because the the equation ordinary least squares uh, regression equation will take the two values attribute them but it'll still make the same prediction so it'll compensate for it there's no need of course to have ridiculously complicated uh, evaluations a zero and one is fine um, but it just shows you how stable the regression equation is okay so let's get in to the actual statistics now that we know what our model is there are a lot of assumptions that need to be satisfied in order to do a linear regression statistics is a little bit like art as you're going to discover there's a lot of judgment required and you're not very often going to get a stark clear answer as to what you're looking at so uh, uh, and, and a lot of the judgment requires uh, some visual visual judgment, uh, what we call the ocular trauma test. Does it look okay? All right. So the first uh, assumption that we need to satisfy for for using ordinary least squares regression is we have to assume that the data is normal. In other words, if we were to take the the data for a variable and then to plot it, that it would look like a normal bell curve. If we don't have a normal bell curve, we're going to have a bias, which means the results we're going to get are less reliable. And if we get data that's not normal, normally the solution is get more data. And if you get more data, data eventually settles itself down into some sort of normal distribution. Now, maybe if you're looking at something like height or weight, you're going to have a skewed uh, a, a sort of bulge 
on the x-axis and then it'll sort of trail out because of course there's no negative weight and there's no negative age or negative height so um, uh, that type of data is is not going to look normal but you're still going to have a, a sort of a, a mound with with uh, two lower edges so uh, sometimes you won't have data that's normally distributed and I'm going to uh, uh, show you some techniques on what to do when the dependent variable is not normally distributed and that'll come uh, later on but we need to confirm that the data is normally distributed so how do we do that we check for something called skewness and kurtosis so what's skewness skewness measures the extent to which uh, the uh, uh, peak uh, of the bell curve is leaning left or right if it's leaning left it'll have a negative value if it's leaning right it'll have a positive value and and if it's skewed too much it'll no longer be normal uh, kurtosis measures the extent to which the bell curve rises or flattens right if it's really really flat or if it's very very peaked okay now uh, skewness and kurtosis are the first thing that we're going to check in the uh, notes that you have you're going to have bolded italicized uh, instructions on what command words to use and uh, different versions of SPSS sort of drift over the years and I've been using SPSS since the early 90s so that's uh, almost 30 years the the the, the uh, terms vary a little bit sometimes it'll say run sometimes it'll say analyze so don't be too put out just look for a term that looks comparable although my notes are up to date uh, you might use a slightly older version of SPSS so don't get frazzled all right, so the procedure is we go to analyze, and you'll be going to analyze a lot. That's where most of the statistics are. We go down to descriptive statistics. We go here to descriptives, and we click on it. And it says here in the instruction in bold, we have to input anger, sympathy, and efficacy. So we're going to put in anger, sympathy, and efficacy. Now, why are we not putting in Zulu help. Well, because Zulu help is already normalized. It's already been forced into a bell curve. We're also not putting in desex because gender has two categories, male or female. That's not going to give us a normal distribution. Either they're both going to be equal or one's going to be bigger than the other and they'll be heavily skewed. So we also want to go down to the options, which you see on the top right here, and we're going to click um, here, kurtosis and skewness, which are in the center. Make sure they're both ticked. We're going to click uh, continue. Now, I want to show you something. We're going to use the syntax. Normally, you would not use syntax. For more complex procedures, uh, very often uh, you can only do them through syntax. All right? So syntax is going to open up another window. So normally we just click OK, and it'll run, and it'll put the results in the output window. But we're going to put an intervening step in here. What we're going to do is click paste and what this is going to do is paste it to the syntax window so here we are this is the syntax window and you can see the code here now how do we run the code well uh, first important thing is make sure you have a period at the end of your uh, commands right in the command code because that indicates the end of the command so you want to highlight it and you'll see here there's a green triangle once you've highlighted it make sure you highlight the period at the end you hit the uh, green arrow and boom you get your result so this is the that was an intervening step because sometimes you're going to want to save your syntax and there is one procedure we're going to do um, uh, down the road which will require you to use syntax so that's how you um, uh, you put the end syntax in and plus all these windows can be saved just a general note when you save your syntax you can put that into a text file when you're saving your output it will create tables it will create um, uh, some graphs uh, you're going to have to copy and paste special object or copy and paste special uh, it will not copy using the conventional copy commands okay so if you want to import uh, or rather export some of these graphs uh, to another file a word file uh, or Google Docs you're gonna have to um, uh, do the special copy and paste now for your paper please look at the papers you're supposed to critique 
for the type of formatting. That's the formatting you're going to see in journals and book chapters. That's the formatting I want you to use. I do not want you to use SPSS tables and graphs. Well, uh, some graphs, yes, if you tailor them. But I don't want to see standard SPSS graphs and tables in your paper. Okay? It's, it's not that it's a bad habit, but I want you to get into the habit of using the format uh, that's used uh, in publications. Because uh, if you can produce a paper with that, then you'll be able to read a paper with that. And ultimately, the goal is for you to be able to consume statistics easily. Okay, so let's take a look at um, uh, what we have here. The key values we're interested in are skewness statistic and kurtosis statistic. And you can see them here. And this is how we evaluate them. The variables, anger, sympathy, and efficacy, are normally distributed. They have a nice normal bell curve if the statistic is valued at less than 1. So if you look at sympathy, we've got a minus 0 0.97, uh, or rather 0 0.097. Uh, that's virtually a 0. Uh, and the closer it is to 0, the more normal it is. So sympathy uh, is, uh, in terms of skewness and kurtosis, very normal. Efficacy uh, also, in terms of skewness and kurtosis, is very normal. Although kurtosis is getting, you know, at minus 0.7, it's getting pretty close to 1. So it's, it's comfortably, comfortably normal. Anger, on the other hand, is above 1. Okay, so once you uh, exceed 1, uh, you're, you're in the tolerable zone, but you're definitely not normally distributed once you exceed a value of 2. Anger does not exceed a value of 2. It only exceeds a value of 1, so it is tolerably normal. In other words, these three independent variables um, are not going to create biased results. Now, if, the, if, you know, if we were going to have a problem, the solution would be to increase the sample size. Get more data. You're going to hear that again and again. It's a mantra. Uh, it, it solves a lot of problems. Get more data. And the general rule of thumb is, uh, and this is a bare, bare minimum, is you want to have 100 cases per independent variable. And because your paper is going to have three independent variables, you want to have three cases. And right away, that's going to be a problem. In international relations, for example, if you wanted to do a time series, uh, you'd have to have three centuries of data for three independent variables. And we actually don't have three centuries of data. So we're going to have issues with all time series papers. But um, that's not going to deter us. All right, um, and that's a bare minimum. Um, I, I would much rather have a thousand cases per variable. A hundred cases per uh, variable is is really a bare minimum uh, to be confident that you're not going to get some um, instability, meaning it's not going to undermine your significance test, your F statistic. So that was step two. Now we're going to go to step three. Step three is running a Pearson's R. It's actually the bivariate regression that we uh, calculated by hand. And we're going to do this between each independent variable. Because we're trying to control for something which is nefarious that's called multicollinearity. Multicollinearity. comes from collinearity in linear algebra. Or basically it means parallel values. Theoretically, we do not want our independent variables in the model to be the same thing. We want anger and sympathy and efficacy, for example, to be different things. If we were to run a model and we would include my height in metric measurement and my height in imperial measurement, we would be double counting a value. And SPSS would detect it. Now, the problem with multicollinearity is if we have two variables that are the same thing or measure the same thing, it's going to create a bias. And bias is always bad because it reduces the accuracy and reduces our confidence in the result. So we don't want multicollinearity. So in ordinary least square regression, the criteria is we don't want any variable to exceed a Pearson R correlation of 0.75. In other words, we don't want... 75% of the variance in one value or variable to be predicted by the other variable. Now, what is the most common cause of multicollinearity? It's not that two variables are the same thing. It's that there's a common prior cause. So you've got something like unemployment and you've got um, 
uh, something like deflation in the economy, and they're very highly correlated, but one doesn't cause the other. They're both caused by a precipitous collapse in demand. So theoretically, they're, they're distinct things, but because they're so closely related, you can't both include them. You have to exclude one of them. So what's the procedure for determining whether we have multicollinearity? So again, we're going to go up to analyze. Okay? And you can see we can go to, uh, yeah, here we have analyze here. Um, you can actually go to analyze in either the, the, the data table or here uh, in the output table. It's a, uh, SPSS is nicely modular. So we go to analyze, we go to correlate, and we go to bivariate, because we're looking at um, comparing one variable against another variable. And so here we're going to input all the independent variables, including dsex. All right, you can see the symbol here for dsex. Now, very often when you're operating this table, you're going to find that the names are going to scrunch up, and you won't be able to read the names. You can always widen the table by putting your cursor on the edge of the uh, table and make the, the, this little dialog box larger. So don't be deterred. You're not a prisoner of the size of this little container. So we put in anger. We put in uh, sympathy. Uh, we put in uh, efficacy. And we've got in desex. And Good, so we are now going to run these. Now we're going to click OK because we're not going to um, we're not going to um, paste the syntax here. This this is a relatively simple uh, process, and we're going to make sure we're on a Pearson R uh, correlation. All right, so here it is. Here's our correlation table. Uh, how do we read this? Well, I'll tell you what we don't read. We're not going to look at the significance uh, two-tail test. Irrelevant. Don't care about that. We're not going to look at n, the number of cases. We don't care about that. The only value we're interested in is the Pearson correlation. And you'll see we've got 4 comparing against 4. So you'll get dsex, obviously having a 1 because it's a perfect correlation with itself. And anger and anger are valued at 1 because they have a perfect correlation. So let's take a look at some of the values. So we see that uh, desex, the gender variable, uh, is very unrelated to anger. It's unrelated to sympathy. It's unrelated to efficacy. We can see that anger is unrelated to sympathy or efficacy. And we can see that sympathy is, is unrelated to um, efficacy. So it all checks out. There's no value here that's higher than uh, 0.75. Okay, so what we've done here is we've regressed these uh, independent variables against each other if if we had a case where two variables were uh, correlated higher than 0.75 and are essentially measuring the same thing or two different aspects of the same thing uh, probably because of a, of a common prior cause or an antecedent variable we would either exclude one of them or we could find uh, some novel way of combining them and there's a really really ugly solution called factor analysis, which is a terribly complex method. It takes variables, puts them together, rips them apart, and then reconstitutes them, like some sort of processed food. And while it does increase the power of the variables in the model, when it comes to trying to explain what the variable is to decision makers, uh, you will not succeed. So you should never use factor analysis. You should, you should use factor analysis if you're trying to make accurate predictions and you're working for a polling company and you're confident you know what the factors are that you've created in a very abstract, esoteric sense. But do not use a factor analysis, very, a factor uh, analysis analyzed variable uh, if you're trying to communicate the model to a decision maker. Uh, they will never understand. So that was uh, step three, and we've satisfied uh, those requirements. So now we're on to step four. In step four, we're going to scatter plot individual independent variables with a dependent variable to assure that there's no nonlinearity. Okay, specifically, no nonlinearity. What does that mean? It means that we don't care if the dots look like a shotgun blast on a barn door. We don't care if it looks random. What we do not want is a nonlinear relationship. And specifically, we don't want a, a set of curved dots, like dots that are grouped together and somehow move over in a curved fashion. 
uh, that's a problem. Uh, because linear regression is linear, uh, if you have a, a curved distribution of data in, in the relationship between an independent and a dependent variable, it's going to create a lot of bias. Because if you put a line through a curve, you're going to underestimate some portions and overestimate other portions, and it's therefore something we have to identify and fix. Okay, so uh, the solution is to transform the data. In other words, to alter typically the independent variable. Um, so we don't transform the dependent variable because then we'd have to recompare it with all the independent variables and then we'd have to see if they're curved and it just it, it, you end up with a very large complicated problem. So normally you leave the dependent variable as it is and you only transform the independent variables because uh, they don't cause you to then have to go back and check every other independent variable. Alright, so let's go through the process here. Here we're getting a little bit um, visual. So uh, we're going to go to graphs, legacy dialogues, scatter dot, we're going to go to matrix scatter. Now you can always use simple scatter. That'll uh, uh, compare two variables at the same time. With matrix scatter, it allows you to compare a whole bunch of variables at the same time. All right, so we're going to define it. Uh, we're going to put into the matrix uh, variables dialog box uh, the dependent variable, Zulu help, because here we're contrasting the variables um, with each other. We're going to put in anger, efficacy, sympathy, and we're not putting in desex. And why are we not putting in desex, the uh, gender dummy variable? Because you're not going to be able to graph anything. It only has two values. Either all the dots will be clustered at one point or, the, or, or they will all be clustered at another point. And at those two points, you'll just get two very, very dark, dense dots. So we're not going to look at those. So here again, we click OK. And we look at the output we get in the output window. See here, it's taking a few seconds. And it's, it, it's not uncommon for there to be a delay when you've got uh, graphs being produced. So what we're looking at here, we want to examine the scatter plot for each of the IVDV pairs to ensure there's no curvilinearity. We, we're not comparing we're not comparing the uh, independent variables with each other like we did in our multicollinearity. Here we're only looking at each of the dependent variable, independent variable pairs. So if we look at uh, sympathy uh, here, sympathy here and uh, Zulu help, we see it's diffuse, but it looks linear actually. You've got this bottom left, top right type of motion going on. Uh, if you look at uh, anger, and Zulu help, it looks like it's sort of skewed to the left, right? You've got low values of the IV. It, it sort of looks linear too. Um, yeah, but it, it, it's not really curvilinear. And now we look at efficacy and Zulu help, and there's a light, slight skewness to the, to the right, I guess. But it looks, it looks generally like a, a random collection of dots with some sort of bottom left, top right type of motion to it. Again, it depends, when I'm describing these, it depends how they're oriented because they're, they're sort of rotated depending on which of these graphs you're going uh, to look at. So the general assessment here is that there's no transformation required in the data. If there uh, was some uh, curvilinearity, then we'd have to transform the independent variable values to get rid of that curvilinearity. Now that's a problem, of course, because when you're explaining again the outcome of your model to the decision maker, you have to tell them that this is not the raw data. This data has been transformed mathematically so that we can avoid bias, which does take some effort in reinterpreting what the real values of that uh, variable are. Right? There's, there may not be a direct correspondence with you know, how many people are taking the train every day. Uh, it might be um, a transformed version of that number, which makes it more difficult to understand. And that's, you know, that's, that's your job as a scholar to translate these values into things that the decision makers can uh, consume. So let's go and examine a nonlinear relationship that is in need of transformation. Okay, so we're going to get a new data set. All right, we're going to go back here. We're going to click open, 
data. And the data we're going to get is called anxiety.save. Okay? Uh, this particular uh, data set, uh, you can see right here, we've got anxiety, we've got exam. So it's a bivariate relationship. We've got the exam is obviously the exam result grade uh, score uh, on 100. Uh, anxiety is a measure of the pre-exam anxiety measured on a low to a high scale. That's 1 to 10 with um, fractions as well. And so we want to uh, see what the relationship is between anxiety and exam. Okay, so there's 74 cases in this particular uh, data set. So the first step is to diagnose the linearity of the relationship. So we're going to go back. We're going to go to graph, legacy dialogues. Legacy dialogues means dialogue boxes used by old people like me because we like these kinds of things. Uh, most people don't use those now. They have a chart builder on the top, which is more advanced. So we have a, we go to scatter dot, just like we did before. Now we're going to use simple scatter because we just have two uh, variables, so we want to be able to see what's going on. So we're going to define it. In the y-axis, we're going to put the exam because, as you know, the dependent variable is always where the y-axis is. And anxiety is an independent variable, and it goes where the uh, x-axis is because the x-axis always has the independent variable. All right, and we're going to click run. Okay. All right, here we go. Wow, look at that. See, that is definitely uh, not nonlinear. This is a curvilinear uh, relationship. Looks like a, it's not a bell curve. It looks like a, it rises up to a peak in the center and then tapers off down again on the, uh, on the right. So this is a curvilinear relationship. If we were to run this model, the reason we'd have bias is you could imagine having to stick a broom handle through this thing, a, a, a line of best fit, a regression line, and it's going to underestimate, or rather overestimate the values on the extreme left and right, and it's going to underestimate the values of the center. So we're going to get a lot of residual values, a lot of error terms between the data points and sort of the rubber band lengths between the nails to the, to the broom handle. So that's a problem. Okay. So this is a, what we would call an inverted U converted uh, a, a curvilinear relationship. So um, the basic theory here is that some anxiety is beneficial, but too much hampers performance. Right, that's the conclusion. And this is normal. I mean, in nature, we have a lot of curvilinear relationships, and this is a very intuitive, obvious one. Right? So the solution is we have to transform the independent variable to render the relationship more linear. All right, so the next step is to determine which mathematical transformation fits best. Okay, so we have four basic types. If the data is an F-curve, where it'll start off on the uh, bottom uh, left and it'll sort of peak up and then um, abruptly become horizontal and go right. So it looks like an F, an F without the, the small middle part. Uh, then we're going to get the log. Okay, and uh, how would we do that? Well, you would go to SPSS um, uh, to the transform function and you can see here at the top there's a, a compute variable. and uh, you would look for arithmetic and there is here you can see a natural log or a log 10 and uh, you would move the log 10 here and then you would insert your uh, independent variable uh, exam of course is the dependent variable we never transform the dependent variable it's chaotic you would transform here and you put in a new variable which I guess could be log anxiety Right or low ganks, right? You click OK and it'll create a new column. Uh, in fact, let's let's do that it's sort of fun. Let's see what we have here. We have low ganks, so it's it's created us a log. But we don't have that kind of curve, so uh, obviously that's not the um, solution we're looking for. All right. So um, now, if the data is an L curve, let's just go back to our graphic representation. We want to see what this thing looks like. If the data is an L curve again, which this is not, but you can imagine an L. Uh, then we transform the independent variable on the x-axis into its reciprocal, which means we basically put a 1 on top, like a fraction, a numerator, and then we uh, divide into the 1. Uh, and then, you know, again, it, you, you, you could um, go and pull this into Excel and then do the calculation there. Uh, if the data is a bell curve, then you use the quadratic. Now, this here is actually a bell curve. What does a quadratic mean? It's actually... Uh, a complicated term for something that's very simple. It just means multiply the independent variable by itself. 
Uh, or you can do the cubic, which is multiply the independent variable by itself three times. Right? So that's uh, using complicated terms for simple, like, simple calculations. And the fourth if is uh, if the data is a soft Z curve, then you get the log of both the dependent variable on the Y axis and the uh, independent variable on the X axis. But again, uh, I am wary of transforming dependent variables because it creates a mess because then you have to recheck to see if you still have a non curvilinear relationship with all the other independent variables. and can you imagine having to then retransform the dependent variable or the independent variables another time? You end up with a, a multi-layered cake of transformations that you could not disentangle. Uh, so um, be sparing when you do your transformations. Now there's no question that transformations are time consuming, right? And they uh, benefit from extensive trial and error and the solutions are rarely perfect. Now an obvious note, Logarithms do not work with zero or negative values. We don't use slide rules anymore. We have calculators, so logarithms are not that much in use. But the reason we had logarithms is with a slide rule, uh, they made the observation that with very large numbers, you could get some incredibly accurate answers because you can add and subtract logarithms in the same way that you have, uh, you multiply very, very large numbers. And so before calculators, people would use logarithms to do large calculations. Um, so we still use logs, but um, you are not as familiar with logs as likely uh, people two generations before you. And they would know uh, you cannot log a zero number or a negative number. You basically get gobbledygook. So all transformed IVs uh, would uh, then have to be regressed against the dependent variable in a scatter plot to confirm that the transformation was successful. So. Let's go ahead and quadratically transform anxiety and then replot it to see what happens. Okay, so we're going to go up to transform and compute variable. Uh, we're going to get rid of our log value here. Now, I, I, as you'll see from the data set, I've already got a, a, a Q anxiety here. Q anxiety is uh, the um, quadratic of anxiety, anxiety multiplied by itself. So I'm going to move anxiety up here. I'm going to move in an asterisk from the calculation here. I'm going to put in another anxiety. So anxiety times anxiety is going to be, I'm going to put QQ anxiety here as the new variable. It's going to add a new variable on my, uh, let's see, do I have everything here? Yeah, it looks good, looks good. So we click OK. Let's go take a look at what's happening. Yeah, we've got this new um, variable, QQ anxiety. So let's see what happens when we run the graph. So again, we follow the legacy dialog box scatter dot, we're in the simple scatter, define. We're going to throw out anxiety and throw in QQ anxiety. And here we go. Well, it's it's lessened. Looks like it's l sort of lessened it. It's actually shifted the peak uh, somewhat to the left. What do you say we do the cube? All right, so we'll multiply anxiety times anxiety times anxiety. All right, we'll call that QQQ anxiety. Let's see what happens. Are we able to, there we go. So we've made a new variable, QQQ anxiety, which is the cubic. Let's go see if we have dealt with the problem. Uh, let's get rid of QQ anxiety and throw in QQQ anxiety. Oh, this is slightly better. It really, you know, what it's done is it, it's, it's sort of squishing the dots uh, to the left and then leaving uh, some scattered points off to the right. But it's sort of successfully reducing the degree of curvature by depopulating the curve on the right. So the transformation had, I would say, moderate to little impact in this case. It wasn't what I would describe as very successful. So let's go back to our data set because we have to go on to our next level. Save contents? No, we, yeah, no, we're gonna, sorry, we're gonna save contents for the output. What we don't want is this data set. We don't need this data set. We need, we also don't need this untitled data set or this untitled data set or this untitled data set. Here we are. We're back to our original uh, data set here. So step four um, was, uh, yeah, what we just, uh, what we just finished. 
scatter plot. So what we need to do next is to identify and potentially exclude data points that are significantly farther from the mean than two standard deviations. It sounds sort of peculiar, but if you're trying to do a study of human health, you would not put a superhero um, inside your data set because they're going to be uh, super strong and super fast and have laser vision and they're going to uh, distort your, um, your results. Now, it's normal for 68% of people uh, to be within uh, one standard deviation of the mean, above and below, and 95% uh, to be within two standard deviations, and 99% to be within three standard deviations. But sometimes you end up with a value that's 25 standard deviations away, like Pluto, tiny, tiny little single data point extremely far away. Now, Pluto doesn't have much of an effect on uh, what we do here on Earth, its gravitational pull, is, is completely unmeasurable by, by our instrumentation. But in ordinary least squares regression, if you remember, we have nails connected to a broom handle using a rubber band. Imagine stretching a rubber band from Pluto to Earth. That rubber band is going to be so tight and so taut, it will have a huge effect on the Earth. In ordinary least squares regression, an extremely distant outlier because of the sum of least squares, has a huge impact on the bias of the model, negatively so. So, what we want to do is temporarily remove extreme outliers. And to do that, we first want to detect if we have these outliers. Now, you have an infinite regression problem to some extent, where if you take out every data point that's beyond two uh, standard deviations, which is about 5% of the total data, because 95% of the data is always within two standard deviations of the mean, then your your uh, bell curve is going to resituate itself, and new data points will be introduced into what what is now the vacant area beyond two standard deviations. And if you take out those uh, points beyond two standard deviations, then again, your bell curve will resettle, and you'll have new data points that will populate and, you'll, and eventually you're going to run out of data points if you keep doing this. So we only do this once. We take out the most extreme data points, and then we would rerun the model to see if there's a significant difference. All right. Uh, now, it might be that you don't have that kind of problem, but uh, you can't be sure, uh, which is why we test these things. We're never sure uh, of, of the structure of our data. You might always have some extreme country or an extreme case or an extreme event uh, that is uh, totally beyond expectation and will uh, drag your regression line uh, uh, way out of sync with the uh, other distribution of the dots. Okay, So these are called outliers and we want to identify them and we don't want them to skew the generalizability of our regression results. right? Because it'll, it'll basically take our normal curve and put an enormous uh, 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 skewness to it. Okay, So this is how we do it. We go to procedure uh, the procedure, rather, is, gra is, is to go to the graph. We go to legacy uh, dialogues. We go down to uh, histogram. All right, and we're going to click um, at, at the top here, display normal curve. Okay, so we're going to run this for uh, Zulu help, right, our dependent variable. Stick it into the uh, variable. We're going to click OK. Yeah, that looks normal. Right, we don't see any extreme um, values there in terms of standard deviations. You know, it gives us the mean here. So, no, that's pretty good. And these are, again, this is all already normalized. So uh, we can see it's, it's not farther than four standard deviations on the right and uh, less than uh, three standard deviations on the left. So things are pretty normal there. So let's go to the next variable, which is, uh, we can go to graphs. We're going to go to sympathy. Legacy dialog box, we go to histogram. You guys might, must have done histograms in uh, methods class in CGEP or uh, in prior classes. All right, we throw out Zulu help, and we're going to throw in our independent variable, sympathy. In goes sympathy. What does it look like? Yeah. Again, these are here for sympathy. We're looking at raw scores, right? It's on a 1 to 10 scale, so, uh, or rather, a 1 to 7 scale. 1 to 7 scale. You can see there's like very normal distribution. All right, on to anger. Histogram, bye-bye sympathy. 
hello anger I wonder why it's not uh, alphabetical. All right, here we go. Yikes. Okay, so uh, that's a lot of ones there, I guess, which means people are not angry, which is a good sign. Um, a couple of people are quite angry at seven. Someone's uh, out outstandingly furious. Um, I don't think that's an outlier because it's within the range one to seven, uh, and it's appropriately rare. So this is you know, not a normal curve. Um, but it approximates one given that you just don't have that many angry people. I think maybe the scale is wrong, right? If they had the scale set um, to something like how perturbed are you, then we'd have a more normal curve. So this, is, this could be solved using measurement solutions. All right, next variable, last one, efficacy. So legacy dialogues, histogram, we throw out anger, we get efficacy throw it in and yeah this also looks like a normal curve yeah you got a, sort of a bulge in the center it's got quite a few uh, it's actually much flatter than the other results now there's uh, something else we can do that I've done in the past you can go to analyze and descriptive statistics and descriptives and uh, what it'll actually let you do is you can put save standardized values as variables, right? So um, uh, let's check the options here. Yeah. So what it'll actually do is, is it, if you look here, we've added some variables. So here we've got these new variables, and it's got z in front, as you can see, because it's been normalized, like I told you before, and we can now check that these values are uh, in terms of standard deviations. So if they're a minus, they're below the mean. If they're positive, they're above the mean. And we see a lot of values here, two. I uh, see a two here. Yeah, I noticed none of the values are, 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 are at, oh, here we go, we got uh, a 3.2. That's the most extreme case we have, and it doesn't look like it's very far out. Uh, three standard deviations, you're gonna, you're gonna have cases beyond three standard deviations. Um, just, it's very uncommon. But if you were to have a, a, a nine here somewhere, nine standard deviations, that, that's the kind of uh, variable that you'd want uh, to have removed. So, um, uh, so in this particular case, uh, you would you do nothing. But if we had an extreme case, you would remove that um, outlier, and you'd probably want to run two separate regressions to see if that variable had a significant impact on your results. Now, what is the solution if you have lots of extreme values? Well, you know, you've heard this before. Get more data. The more data you collect, the more the data is going to have normal distribution and you're going to have fewer outliers and fewer extreme points. Okay? So, uh, we presume at some point that you've done some uh, linear transformations if you had to do them, and then we would rerun Pearson's R between each of the IVs to control for multicollinearity. Uh, so there's a bit of uh, sort of cycling back and forth between some of these assumptions. But when that, once that's done, we are now ready to run a linear regression, all right? Well, termed a multiple linear regression because we've got uh, multiple independent variables. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to run the model. We're going to uh, examine the strength of the relationship in the form of the R squared, the correlational uh, coefficient. We're going to look at the slope and the standard error for the t-test of significance for each of the independent variables. All right, so I'm just telling you what we're going to do, and then we're going to run this thing, and then we're going to do it. Okay, so... Here we are, finally. So we go to analyze. We go down to regression. We go to linear. So we have here our slot for our dependent variable. Fairly obvious, you can only have one dependent variable. So we put our dependent variable in there. Our independent variables are also gonna be uh, deposited in. We've got anger. We've got efficacy. We've got sympathy, and we've got our dummy variable, desex. So all four of those were put in. Now, you know, we spoke before about assumptions that we had to uh, uh, ensure before we ran the regression, but there are some assumptions we need to check after we run the regression. So we're going to have to save some values that we're going to look at later on. 
So uh, we need to go to the save section here. And there's two blocks. There's predicted values and residuals. Predicted values are your Y hat. It's the dots along the broom handle that we're predicting are going to happen. Residuals are the rubber band. They're the errors and the mistakes and the, and the distance from the broom handle on the rubber band to the various dots. So uh, we're going to choose some values here. So we want to save in the predicted box the unstandardized and the standardized. Right. The standardized, of course, is uh, information forced into a bell curve, and under unstandardized are the raw scores. For the residuals, we're going to save the unstandardized and the studentized. Student is the, uh, again, it's the gentleman who created the T-statistic from the Guinness Beer Company, who uh, measured the middle finger of prisoners in England. So he had a particular transformation that we find very useful. Now we're gonna we click then click continue. Now we're gonna use the enter method. Okay. Now um, uh, where's the enter method? Yeah. So there's here somewhere. Yeah. Here we go. It's a block one. We're not gonna use multiple blocks. We use method enter because what we have is a theoretical driven model. We have an idea. We're gonna put the variables together and we're gonna run it. What you can do, which is uh, I think somewhat a theoretical, is you can just throw all the variables in and have this thing go through multiple iterations until it finds something. And that is basically fishing for uh, evidence, which is not theoretically driven. So you end up with some sort of correlation. You have no causal explanation how. I strongly discourage anyone from doing that. All of this needs to be theoretically driven, because if it is not, we have no causality. Okay. So we also want to put in some plots. So we're going to go up here to the plots on the top right. And into the uh, Y, we're going to throw in the Z pred. The Z pred is the standardized predicted values. Okay? And into the X, we're going to put in the SD, resid, which is the studentized residual. And this is going to give us uh, a graph. Okay, so we click uh, continue here. And we're ready to go. So we click OK. And let's see what we have. Voila, here's our regression. So it tells us at the top these are the variables that were uh, inserted. Let's go down here to the model summary. Okay, so model summary tells us here we have an R of 0.641. All right, that's not useful. We come here to the R squared, which is 0 0.411. Now, this would be okay if we were running a bivariate regression, but we're not. We have a multiple number of independent variables. When you have multiple independent variables and you keep throwing them on top of each other, you tend to have an inflationary effect in how much you're explaining. So we have to use the adjusted R squared, which is the third number here. What it does is it gives you a more conservative and realistic assessment of how much variance is explained in the dependent variable by the independent variables. So here we have a 0 0.381. This tells us that 38% of the outcome in the dependent variable is explained by the four independent variables. That is actually uh, a moderately strong relationship. It sounds crazy. It's not 70%, it's not 60%, it's just 38%, but that's a good value. This tells us that our model has some uh, strength. But, um, you know, that's not going to be enough. Right? So let's go take a look here at our ANOVA. That's analysis of variance. This is our S statistic. Now we used a table before, um, but here we, you know, we don't need a table. Uh, here, uh, the computer does the calculation for us. Uh, it tells us we have uh, four degrees of freedom, which is the number of independent variables. It tells us that we have uh, 80 cases, and it subtracts. Actually, it's 81 cases, but I think they take a one for the one away from the constant, and so they subtract four independent variables. Uh, from the 80 cases to give us uh, a degrees of freedom of 76. That's what the DF stands for. And this is the degrees of freedom uh, used on a table. And it gives us the raw score of 13.284. And then it tells us the significance is 0 0.000. So what does that mean? It means the probability of a false positive is less than 0 0.00 and then there's some number that's incredibly small down uh, inside the zeros. In other words, there is a very, very, very small chance of a false positive, and this is a good result. Remember, the F-statistic tells us can we generalize the entire model, including the independent variables, 
uh, to the population? And the answer is yes. It means that this study that focuses on um, people providing other people help can be generalized from the 81 cases to uh, millions of cases. So this is, a, this is a good finding, right? So this is the assessment of the overall model. Now we can uh, look at the uh, F statistic chart. Let's, let's take a look at uh, what we have here. So this here is actually a representation of the, of the distribution of the uh, F statistic. You'll see it's not a normal curve. Um, it, it's sort of heavily skewed because it starts at zero. So it's skewed to the left and then it sort of tapers off uh, to the right. So this is the table um, that we've actually seen before, the F statistic table. Now, we again have the 5% at the top, uh, but this time we've got a V1 of 4, right? We have four independent variables, and the number of cases we have is, is uh, 80, which is um, uh, not 120, right? We want to be conservative here, and 120 implies a better significance because there's more data. So we want to go to the next worst level, which is 60. So if we intersect 60 here at this row and the column of four independent variables, we're going to end up with 2.53. So we would take this 2.53 and then compare it to the result on the output. And, the, you know, obviously 13 is much higher than the critical value of 2.53 on the table. So we could tell by using the table that this is significant. But we don't have to. The calculator, the computer other has done it for us, and we know that it's 0 .000. So we have a, a, a high level of confidence this table can be generalized. Now we have the coefficients table. There is a lot of activity here, and every single thing here matters. So let's start with the easiest part. Now I hate the way SPSS constructs the table. They put the beta in the middle. Okay, the beta is uh, the partial R in calculus. It's what we call a standardized coefficient. It's standardized because uh, it's, it's put onto a normal curve. Now what's the benefit of that? The partial R in calculus is this uh, really cool thing you can do with derivatives where you can uh, allow one variable to vary and you freeze all the other variables. So it's the ultimate controlling for uh, other variables. And we spoke about that when we looked at uh, qualitative methodology. You know, statistics does it for you automatically. It's brilliant. So it freezes, it freezes the other values and then uh, your other variables and allows you to then vary the variable um, that you're interested in. And then you can get a relative idea of how much effect that variable has on its own. So the only thing we can use the beta for is a direct comparison of the ranking of the impact of the variables. So if it's negative, it's an inverse relationship. But what we're interested in is magnitude, the size of the, of the relationship. So uh, sympathy has got the highest value at 0.455, so this is the most important variable. Uh, then we have anger, 0.328, and then efficacy at 0.3, and then finally uh, the gender, which matters the least. Okay, so that's the beta. I wish they put the beta somewhere else. Next, we've got the unstandardized coefficients, and that's the B, okay? And you've got the constant. If you recall, the constant is the y-intercept. It's where the regression line passes through the y-axis in the Cartesian graph. And then you've got your B coefficients here. These are all the slopes, right? So we're going to use this to create a regression equation, exactly the same way as when we did it by hand. But before we get there, let's see what else we can do with these values. So we don't care about the other values for the uh, constants. It, they're irrelevant. The constants only used to build the regression equation. But we have here four B coefficients for the four independent variables. And what, we, uh, what the uh, computer calculates for us is it'll take the B coefficient. You divide the B coefficient by the standard error. And you'll notice that the B coefficient divided by the standard error equals the T statistic. Remember the T statistic? Uh, created by that uh, student from Guinness Beer. So 0.3 divided by 0.081 will equal 3.6. And then we go to the t-statistic chart. So in this case, we've got a 3.6. And the computer pre-calculates it for us. It tells us that it's highly significant. So remember, a value of 0 0.000 uh, basically uh, tells us that it's highly significant. There is almost 
no chance of there being a false positive. There's no chance of a coincidence. This is not an illusion. This variable can be extrapolated. Now remember, the threshold in the social sciences is 5%. So we're looking for a value here that's no worse than 0 0.05. If the value is worse than 0 0.05, then there's just too high a probability that there's a coincidence and we can't trust it. We can't generalize from it. And we would rerun the model and probably drop the independent variable. Okay. Now, traditionally for these types of tests, we use a two-sided uh, uh, test because we're not, um, we don't have a directional hypothesis. So here we have the t-distribution ta table. It's different than the one we saw before because here we would choose one-sided or two-sided. One-sided is if we had a direction, we had, a, we had an idea of what direction the, the relationship is supposed to go in. Here we don't, so we use a two-sided estimate. And so here at 5%, we choose the 5% column for the two-sided um, uh, t-distribution. And again, we've got 81 cases, but we can't choose 120. That would be too liberal. We have to be conservative. So we're going to choose uh, 60. Now, if we intersect 60 and we intersect 5%, we end up with this number, 2.000. This is a rule of thumb. And the rule of thumb is if your t-value is higher than 2, it's significant. That's not always true. I mean, if you end up with very, very small numbers, like 10 cases, you're, you're going to have a, you're going to need a value higher than 2. Here, in this case, 2.228. But, um, for what we have here on the output, um, notice how all the T values are higher than 2. Right? And we have 81 cases, which means all of them have cleared. All of them. Alrighty? So if we look at uh, efficacy here, we've got 0.435, there's the standard error, there's the T, there's the significance, sympathy, same thing. All the significances are good. Now for the gender variable, dsex, here we have a minus 0.455 uh, divided by the standard error. Again, the minus doesn't really matter, it just tells us the direction of the relationship, whether it's positive or whether it's inverse. Uh, it gives us here a minus 2.030. And the significance is 0 0.046. It's almost 0 0.05. And if it was 0 0.05 or worse, or, or worse than rather 0 0.05, then it, it, we would throw the variable out. It would not be significant. Here, it's barely significant. Okay? Now, um, we can do more than this. Right? We can take the uh, constants, and we take the B coefficients, which we know are slopes, and we can incorporate these into... Uh, a regression equation. Okay, and we're going to do that in a sec, but I just want to talk a little bit more about the, uh, the coefficients here. So, the t statistic that we looked at earlier, or rather the s statistic that we lo looked at earlier, and the t statistic here, these are both inferential statistics, and they're seeking to determine whether we can extrapolate from our sample of cases to all the cases in the past, the future, or other regions. And it's important because it tells us whether we can extrapolate from our model to other places where the phenomenon is happening. Uh, so it allows us, uh, if we were to do survey work, we could do a very small number of, of surveys, as few as 1,500 people, and we could extrapolate to millions of people. And this is especially important uh, in areas of, of um, uh, polling. Uh, now, it, all of this is based on the central limit theorem, which was discovered in 1733 by Abraham de Moivre, and then extended by Pierre-Simon Laplace, and Johann Carl Friedrich Gauss. Laplace and Gauss, of course, are two famous mathematicians. So the work, again, it goes back to pre-revolutionary uh, French gambling. Um, but it's a super important theory. The assumption of all inferential statistics is that there's no relationship. And this is called the null or zero hypothesis. So the F statistic tries to falsify this assertion, because you can't, of course, prove anything. And by successfully falsifying that there is no probability of a relationship, we know we can extrapolate and therefore generalize our model. Right? And so we want a 95% confidence level that the null is falsified in the social sciences, which is why we go for a 5% um, a significance level. Um, so the statistical significance test tells us what probability there is that the relationship we observe in our sample could occur if there was no actual such relationship in the actual larger population or universe of cases. So if, if no one... Uh, who rode bicycles got sick in the larger population, what's the chance of, in our sample, people riding bicycles and getting sick at the same time? So that's the kind of uh, sort of thought uh, process that we're, uh, we're looking at. Okay, let me show you um, another distribution here. 
So you can see here just a, a comparison between the Z distribution, which is when we standardize uh, uh, values, and we compare that to a T distribution, which is from student, the guy from Guinness. And notice how his distributions are different as to whether you have uh, 30 cases or less than 30 cases. Right? So there's multiple distributions. In fact, there are there's so many different types of data structures. There are books and books with different distributions for different type of data problems. Okay, so um, the next step that we would we would do here is determine uh, whether um, uh, we had any variables that were insignificant, and we would then take them out of the model, and we would rerun the model uh, to see if. Um, uh, uh, removing that variable had an effect. Now, there's you know a very strange phenomenon. There, there are times when you'll have uh, three variables that are significant, one that's not significant. You'll exclude the insignificant variable, and then a variable that was significant will then become insignificant. So there's a lot of complex interactivity, and you, you there's a certain amount of trial and error as you're including and excluding uh, independent variables to see what the follow-on effect is on the other variables. Because variables will end up picking up the variance from uh, the relationship between the IVs and the DVs um, to some extent from each other. Um, so it's, it's a, a very peculiar complex relationship. Alright, so what we have here is the scatter plot between the dependent variable Zulu help and the regression standardized predicted values and the regression studentized deleted residuals. So step eight is the method of testing the linearity assumption. Since the sum of the residuals, the unexplained variance should equal zero, regressing the residuals and the predicted values should show no pattern. So let's look at this. Do you see a pattern? Huh. Well, I don't think I see a pattern. But there's, um, uh, yeah, so this is, this is, uh, what we what we've uh, plotted. Let's see. I think there's another a plot here that we're supposed to do. So there's a legacy scatter dot simple scatter, and we're going to take uh, some values that we created in our model, and we can expand the dialog box. We can see what deck we're doing. In the y-axis, we're going to put in the predicted values. These are unstandardized predicted values. In the x-axis, we're going to put the uh, res one which are the unstandardized residuals. And these are different from the chart that we have here. Here, the values are standardized and studentized. And we see no pattern here. And this is a test of the same thing, using unstandardized values. And again, we don't see any relationship. Uh, we want to see a random distribution with no patterns, or a linear association. If we end up with a pattern here, it means we have a uh, some effect that we didn't capture with the variables. And the solution then is to use a technique called weighted least squares, which is a pain in the butt. But if we don't solve this problem by running weighted least squares, it tells us that we're going to have a huge amount of bias in our results. So step number nine is called heteroscedasticity. It's a bit of a tongue twister. you got to say it about ten times. Heteroscedasticity. Say it with me, heteroscedasticity. Okay, it's the opposite of homoscedasticity. Homoscedasticity is good. Heteroscedasticity is bad. So heteroscedasticity occurs when there's a pattern in the residuals. Remember, the residuals are the, are the distance from the dot to the line of best fit or the plane of best fit. Right. So uh, specifically, when the standard deviations of the residuals are uneven. This usually happens when there's a hidden pattern within the data, usually caused by a missing independent variable. This is called omitted variable bias. So if there's a major phenomenon that affects the dependent variable and you didn't include the independent variable, the model will show you that the variable is missing by giving you a lot of heteroscedasticity. Okay, so let me show you some sample shapes. This is where the art appreciation comes in. So here you can see on the left, this is homoscedasticity. This is what we want to see. We want to see a grouping of dots uh, that are, uh, when, we, when we do the graph, and I'll show you how to do the graph for this, um, that are you know, following perhaps a line, or they could be completely random. 
Here in panel B, we've got heteroscedasticity. It looks like a trumpet. So you've got a very tight grouping of dots, and the variance increases as you approach the right side. In panel C, you've got a trumpet, again, but this time it's pointed to the left. And in panel D, you have a bow tie. So it, you have a, a tight collection of uh, variances in the middle, and then it expands both to the left and the right. These are cases of heteroscedasticity. All right, let me show you more. Uh, here on the left, you've got uh, homoscedasticity. Uh, in the center, B, that's also a homoscedastic, but it's with a small sample, so you get a sort of a normal distribution. Here at the bottom in C, you, you've got heteroscedasticity. You've got here the trumpet shape, which, uh, which I warned you about. And here on the right, you can see four different uh, charts, and you can see um, here in the first panel, the assumptions are met about the predicted values against the residuals. So here you see the residuals, and these are the predicted values. So these, this is the previous diagnostic that we did. And you've, you know, you've got this line that passes through, and uh, the dots are grouped around in sort of a random fashion. Uh, in B, you can see the failure of normality. You've got too much clustering on the top uh, of the dots. Uh, C, you've got nonlinearity, and that's a problem. And then D, you've got heteroscedasticity, all right, which is the uh, changing variances over time. Right? So uh, B, C, and D are a problem. Um, and D here, you've obviously got a missing variable. It's called omitted variable bias. Right, it's something that uh, needs to be solved. Okay, so let's go and calculate um, whether we have heteroscedasticity. So we're we're hoping for homoscedasticity when there's no pattern among the residuals. So the method of testing the equality of the variance assumption. This is how we test heteroscedasticity. The error term, which are the residuals, it's the the basically the length of the rubber bands has a zero mean and is normally distributed when, when you add them all up. And so regressing the studentized residuals and the standardized predicted values should show no pattern. The studentized residuals should also be regressed against each independent variable, uh, which I'm not going to do, but you can do it on your own. This was done in the initial regression commands above. Um, so the scatter plot of the studentized residuals and the standardized predicted values reveals no heteroscedasticity in our result, which is good. We must also determine whether heteroscedasticity is present in the scatter plots of the studentized residuals and the individual independent variables. Well, it looks like we are going to do that procedure. We're going to go to graphs, legacy dialog, scatter dot, matrix scatter, define, and we're going to input in, we're going to open this up so we can see more clearly, we're going to put in SRE, which is the studentized residuals. Um, in some of the older SPSS versions, this is uh, also called SDR. Okay, so just be aware that there's two separate names for these. And we're going to throw SDR in here with the other independent variables. And it should also include, uh, we don't need Zulu help, but we do need DSEX, which is not in. So we throw DSEX in, and we click OK. Let's see what happens. So you have to imagine, and you can see d is, is you know, completely pointless because you, it, it, we only have two points. Now, for these others, you, you have to imagine that where it's flat, you would sort of project a line through. And it's sort of hard to say whether there's heteroscedasticity or not. Uh, in general, it looks like we have um, sort of symmetry. Um, some of these look like trumpets. If you look at uh, the studentized residuals here in anger, it sort of looks like a trumpet in efficacy, but I don't think it really is a trumpet. It's, it's more sort of bungled up than that. So not being trumpet-like and not looking like a bow tie, I would say there's no heteroscedasticity here. Right? This is what we're reduced to. It's basically art appreciation looking at heteroscedasticity graphs. This is, this is what mathematics and statistics is. Uh, it's, it's not as tangible as you thought it would be. Uh, it's a lot more amorphous. All right, so step number 10, the regression equation. 
So for the regression equation, uh, we build it exactly the same way that we did with the uh, uh, when we did the regression by hand. We have the y hat is equal to uh, the constant minus 4.272 plus uh, the coefficient for anger, which is 0.3 times x, which is the uh, variable. We're going to choose the value for x. Anger, of course, goes from 1 to 7, and so we would choose what the value of x is plus 0.35, which is the coefficient of eff efficacy, times y. And again, y is a value we're going to choose between 1 and 7, because that's the uh, range of values for e efficacy, plus 0.499, which is the coefficient for sympathy, times z, which is the uh, value for sympathy, which goes from the value of 1 to 7, and we would pick which of those values we're going to put in there, plus, uh, let's say, uh, k, which is the variable for gender, and, uh, time, and the value there would be uh, times the coefficient of minus 0.455. Now for k, we put in the value 0 for male or 1 for female, right? So let me show you uh, what those would look like. I've got the, uh, the uh, there we go. The regression equation is here at the end. There we go, let's zoom in on that. So that's it right here. Right. I'm just gonna zoom in, zoom in better so I can see the, uh, we can see the equations better. Da, 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 da. There we go. So you can see at the top here, uh, Zulu help is equal to the constant plus anger plus sympathy plus efficacy plus desex, and you can run a sample, as I've done here, uh, four anger, two sympathy, three efficacy, and I have chosen female, and you 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 end up with this prediction, right? It tells us with the constant. Uh, so we're looking at someone here who's uh, fairly fairly irritable. Uh, not very sympathetic, <laughs> marginally efficient, um, and uh, apparently they're not very helpful. <laughs> um, so this is this is one standard deviation plus below the mean. So this is this is not a very helpful person uh, at all. Um, so this is basically the uh, regression procedure. So some elements um, that I did not include. Uh, here you can see um, methods of generating uh, predicted values. I'm not going to actually uh, go into this, um, but you can read it if, if you wanted to do um, analysis using uh, predicted values. What I do want you to see is the importance of blue. Um, blue, which is actually not on this page here, but what blue is, and it's in your notes, blue is the best linear unbiased estimate. And so a lot of the assumptions that you have to satisfy uh, were done so that the results of regression, um, the results that were produced, were going to give you results that were not biased. And this is a major priority. Uh, regression can be very easily unbalanced if the assumptions are not satisfied. And so we have to put a lot of focus on the assumptions before we run the regression and then the diagnostics after we run the regression so that the correlational statistics that we're looking at and the inferential statistics, especially the F-statistic and the T-statistic, are valid. Because if we have a bias, then we may not be able to generalize our results and the regression equation that we're constructing is, is going to look like it's making predictions, but the predictions are going to be uh, quite far off. Right, so this was the linear regression procedure. The quantification of military planning has been going on for thousands of years, but really took off during the Second World War. It's always been a part of logistics, uh, which is an outgrowth of tax collection for the state, and military engineering, which is a part of construction. Here you can see a pontoon bridge built by the Persian Emperor Xerxes to facilitate the movement of his armies into the Balkans and into what is today Ukraine. There was a lot of math applied during the First World War to help determine 
how to maximize the application of medicines for those soldiers most likely to recover and return to combat duty. And these were survival tables that later evolved into Cox regression math. During the Second World War and the lead up to it, the U.S. Navy played war games, which, which is still a part of the uh, tradition of the U.S. Naval War College, to plan for war against Japan. As WARG, the Anti-Submarine Warfare Operations Research Group during the Second World War, used math and operations research to design the patrol patterns for ships and aircraft during the Battle of the Atlantic against German submarines. The Naval Ordnance Laboratory used operations research and wargaming to examine the application of mine warfare against Japan's vulnerable logistical lines from Southeast Asia. The development of linear and dynamic programming solutions took off in the 1940s and 50s, and this was coupled with the computer revolution, which led to an increased ability to make computations. Sigma I-64 was a program used by the U.S. Air Force to plan its bombing of North Vietnam, although ultimately it was not very successful. Types of research tools. Miniature gaming, using a small soldiers or symbols of small soldiers, has been around since ancient times. Some of its entertainment manifestations are in games like chess. But moving soldiers on a map was much easier than exercising actual troops in a field, as long as those movements were realistic, which required experienced persons running the simulations. Fred Jane had a recreational war game that focused on naval ships in the end of the 19th century and early 20th century and that gaming company has since evolved into a professional analytic organization that serves uh, various militaries. The Prussians developed Kriegspiel which was a war game used for their officers and it includes, included randomized elements this tradition went on to the Japanese and uh, to the Germans and was used for most of the large campaigns. Operations researchers very often focus on known effects of weapons and Lanchester equations very often don't make use of wargaming because they like to focus on the quantifiable. So there are specializations in how you analyze military problems. Wargamers and operations researchers don't always uh, work together. The RAND Corporation, meaning Research and Development, was created in the 1950s by the U.S. Air Force to house intellectuals who use, use operations research and wargaming to try to figure out how the U.S. Air Force could use nuclear weapons, both in terms of deployment and in an actual war. One of its early developments was that of the hexagonal grid for land maps. And this was then taken up by commercial war games in the 1950s and the 1960s, which is mostly driven by historians and their ability to conduct primary research, particularly uh, about the uh, Orbats or the identity of the military organizations uh, that participated in wars and battles on both sides, which was very often difficult to determine. One of the uh, earliest games was Panzerblitz, which came out in 1970, which was a tactical simulation of German and Soviet armored and infantry warfare on the Eastern Front. Larry Bond developed Harpoon as a paper dice war game, which then evolved into a naval war game, which was then used as a simulation by the U.S. Navy. A type of model used in land warfare is called a piston model, where you've got a column and you estimate the military forces, the two adversaries on both sides of that piston, as they push back and forth within that geographic column. And then you have multiple geographic columns parallel to each other with these forces pushing back and forth. There are random elements and stochastic elements uh, in how some of the more sophisticated piston models were used. In general, combat simulations can be interesting, but designing them is often quite difficult. And once designed, the institutional memory tends to fade. And it takes a lot of time to both design it, learn how to play it. 
So wargaming is not always institutionally adopted or appropriate. Um, when instead you can use a standard operating procedure or simple experience um, is good enough to determine what a likely outcome is. There are multi-layered models where you've got tactical elements as well as operational and strategic and political elements uh, put together. This is typically a, a model that's used when a country is embarking on a major campaign and needs to ensure that specialists are interacting in a simulation to share their collective wisdom uh, to minimize uh, unexpected frictions in the planning of the operation. Now there are different methods of modeling. The US has used a task form. The Institute of Defense Analysis, which is a think tank for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which is the headquarters of the Pentagon, have used TAC war. And these models are very often classified, their formula are classified, and the source of their inputs are also classified. One of the declassified methods that the US used to calculate firepower values in the 1970s and 80s is called WEWUP, which is Weapons Effectiveness Index and Weighted Unit Values. The basic method is to have a physics model that determines the total firepower and then to use an iterative Delphi method, which was adopted by the RAND Corporation. This is where you have a group of experts that converge on a value by taking the average values and then those values of the individuals are shared with other people and then other people in the second iteration typically change their value based upon influence and justifications from other people and you go through three or four stages until you get a convergence on a value or you have the participants not changing their values. WeWub was used to drive procurement and deployment particularly for the Americans in Central Europe during the Cold War and in Korea. And it relied on a base unit called an ADE, which is an armored division equivalent, uh, which modeled the US 3rd Armored Division. And in WeWove calculations, it was worth about 34,500. And all other units uh, in the Soviet military were judged opposite this unit as a proportion of the ADE. Here you can see the generic calculation for the impact of geography on a technology. So these are not the values of the firepower of a technology, rather these are classes of technologies and their estimated firepower efficiency in the attack and defense given different environments. Europe has a flat plain in the north and wooded light hills in the center. Northeast Asia, referring specifically to uh, Korea, uh, has lots of very narrow valleys and the Middle East has uh, much more open terrain for long-range fires. This is the WeWuff system specific for certain armored vehicles and you can see the firepower index, the mobility index, the survivability index, the way calculation and then you've got the normalized value for uh, that particular vehicle. And there are tables and tables of these and you can construct using these individual systems, depending on how many tanks or APCs or helicopters there are in an organization, you can then generate a strength value for the overall unit. And then you can compare these units to see how relatively powerful they are under certain geographic circumstances. Trevor Dupuy used the Quantified Judgment Method, uh, QJM. Uh, he relied also on physics. Um, his formula equals the Operational Lethality Index. And it uses the standard for the extent of damage inflicted in one hour on unarmored soldiers, each occupying a single square meter of space on an infinite plane. So in effect, you're, you're staring at uh, an infinite number of soldiers stretching off to infinity uh, to the left and the right and uh, in front of you and you have a weapon system and you see how many you could kill in one hour. So the total lethality index is equal to the rate of fire times the reliability times the accuracy times uh, C the number of targets per strike times the range measured by an indicator of muzzle velocity and OLI which is the operational lethality index is equal to the TLI the total lethality index divided by the dispersion index 
uh, which we spoke about before. These are the dispersion factors, one for ancient armies. That's essentially uh, directly interpretable as one person per meter, in other words, uh, shoulder to shoulder. Napoleonic area is, is 20, because even though shoulder, soldiers are shoulder to shoulder linearly in front of you, uh, behind them it's empty. So you're looking at lines rather than uh, rectangles of soldiers. American Civil War, you have a slight loosening. World War I, uh, a loosening by a factor of 10 to 250. World War II, 3,000. 70s, 4,000, 80s, 5,000. Now terrain also matters, also uh, influencing how soldiers can disperse and or get cover. Now if you look at the source of the losses during the Second World War, the British in North Africa calculated that 48% of losses were caused by infantry and infantry weapons, specifically heavy machine guns. 15% were caused by armor, and 14% were caused by artillery. So artillery is mostly a suppression weapon in North Africa. So in, in, not in all environments is artillery going to be the preponderant force, especially in the desert where there's opportunity to be highly mobile and to move out of an area that's hit by bombardment. Also, uh, the British experience against the uh, Germans and the Italians, there were not that many tanks. Although tanks were disproportionately important for breakthroughs, um, they were generally focused in one area, the point of breakthrough. The British found that in Italy and Normandy, where you had more constrained environments, 76% of the losses were inflicted by infantry, only 7% by armored, and 8% by artillery. This is uh, quite different from um, uh, the conventional experience, which is about 50% of the losses are inflicted by artillery. So let's examine some issues. Issue number one, the physics of a weapon is often a poor guide to its performance. So it's always important to consider the tactical and operational context of any weapon. An important case is the non-cost effectiveness of a given weapon system. It was believed that aircraft were delicate and that they would therefore be easy to shoot down from the ground with either cannon fire or missiles. However, aircraft have adopted tactics that have made it hard to shoot them down. They attack targets from farther away by using standoff weapons, or like glide bombs or laser-guided weapons or rockets. They fly dangerously low and fast, and they attack those that are trying to shoot them down so that subsequent aircraft are not subjected to attacks. For example, during the Second World War, the Germans believed it would take about 50 shells from their 88 millimeter anti-aircraft gun to shoot down an aircraft. In fact, it took over 12,000 shells on average. During the Vietnam War and the Arab-Israeli Wars, it took more than 50 surface-to-air missiles, like this one, the SA-2, to shoot down a single aircraft. And these are more expensive than the 12,000 shells fired by the 88 millimeter guns. So in fact, the effort to shoot down an aircraft is more expensive than the aircraft itself. But the way the calculus has to be done, it's not the cost of the aircraft, it's the cost of the damage that enemy aircraft inflicts on your friendly ground forces, like trucks being lined up on a road. Another case of uh, cost effectiveness. In the First World War, 230,000 sea mines were deployed to destroy 1,000 merchant and warships. In the Second World War, 2,665 ships were lost to 100,000 sea mines deployed offensively, in other words, dropped by aircraft in enemy harbors. Another 208,000 mines were deployed by the British and Germans in the North Sea, basically to block the movement of ships. Between April and August of 1945, 12,000 mines dropped by U.S. bombers hit 1,101 ships, of which 431 were sunk, for a ratio of 18 mines per ship hit. This was highly effective. Deploying mines in circumstances when mine clearance is inhibited, such as in the middle of a battle or along a sea line of communication, which is very far away from 
mine clearing assets makes these very useful weapons. Now there are claims by other operations researchers which, was, which is that during the First World War um, the impact of mines was actually uh, wrongly exaggerated and that they were not that effective. Here you can see a submarine and those tubes are actually the mine deployment chambers. Now in a second issue, models can be designed to produce outputs in one of two ways. Models can be deterministic. In other words, they take the numbers like the WeWub and they just crunch them using Lanchester equations to produce an outcome. Or they can be probabilistic. In other words, you have an outcome that changes every single time you run it. Harpoon, for example, which relies on probabilities for hits and sinkings, can be used to create these outcomes. Now you would run this probability over and over again, and that's called a Monte Carlo. And then it'll produce for you a bell curve output. And using that, you can calculate the variance and the standard deviation, which then gives you the probable outcomes at different values. In other words, what's the chance of a great victory, or what's the chance of a minor victory, what's the chance of a stalemate, and what's the chance of a defeat? And this we call the stochastics, or the probability distributions. You can also run a sensitivity analysis to find out how much of an effect occurs when you change the value of one of the independent variables that affects the outcome. And so you can subject these outcomes to statistical analyses. Now an important issue for operations research in wargaming is policy relevance because of course war is policy by other means according to Klaushevitz so there's an intimate link. Models must provide cost effective abstractions that can be turned into policy solutions. In other words you want to be able to answer questions or provide perspective to decision makers in policy and politicians. So the types of questions that are often asked are a search for policy options, which are ranked by most likely, strongest, fastest, or most cost effective. The dilemma with all attempts at quantification is that they involve simplifying, abstracting, which sacrifices accuracy for usability. The inputs usually have to be recognized by the customers. Air Force pilots will talk in terms of dogfighting and shooting down the enemy airplanes, whereas computer programmers will program attrition per sortie rates. For this reason, not all aspects of a computer simulation can be black boxed if they're going to be producing understandable findings for the customer. Now, some of the problems with models are, number one, models that are created to satisfy many different agencies and their different questions usually create answers too vague for any single agency. For example, the U.S. Navy wants a system to evaluate the different approaches by North Koreans to block its escort of merchant ships to South Korea uh, in the event of a war. The U.S. Army wants a realistic ground combat system to examine different defensive strategies. Number three, the U.S. Air Force wants a model to examine how it can defeat the North Korean air defense system with different doctrines and force structures. Example four, the Pentagon wants to evaluate different weapon systems to see which is the most cost-effective to guide its procurement policies and budget. Number five, the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency wants to know the highway and the railway system in North Korea to measure its logistic capacity in order to estimate how many supplies are going to go to their frontline troops. Expensive because of the data collection is required. So because of the ter personnel turnover in all bureaucracies, the corporate memory of how to operate a given simulation is forgotten unless the simulation is made sufficiently simple to run. And this is not going to occur with a complex, modern computer system. Four, since computer outputs depend on accurate inputs, the data requires considerable research. One way of doing this is to use the simulation findings of lower level physical or tactical models to generalize to higher orders of aggregation, such as the theater operation. You can do this, for example, in the diminishing returns in battle. Right? The economy of force matters because of the diminishing returns. For each additional unit committed to battle, 
their individual impact diminishes because there's difficulty deploying them or they may not find enough front space on the battlefield in order to actually target the enemy. The effect of diminishing returns upon the defender is much more severe than it is for the attacker. In other words, if you're defending, you need something to defend behind, and typically an open environment has a limited supply of those types of defilade or enfilade positions. So in the interests of the economy of force, it appears to be unnecessary and not really cost effective to build up a combat power superiority greater than 2 to 1. In practice, Germans approximated this ratio without excess, whereas the Allies tended to throw a lot more offensive and defensive power if the situation were available. You can see here an estimation of that phenomenon by Dupuy, where the attacker, the attacker gets a benefit as, uh, as high as a 3 to 1 ratio, where the defender does not get a benefit beyond about 1.6, 1.7 in terms of the ratio. So there's more opportunity for the attacker to deploy extra forces than there is for the defender. Now, fifth issue, the concepts and causal logic has to make sense. In 1996-1997, the Red Cross came out with a document demonstrating that landmines were useless. The landmines were useless because they were not a decisive contributor to deaths in battle. Now, they determined that decisive meant that as a direct cause, the mines were not found to cause 10% or more of enemies' losses. And therefore, you could get rid of mines, and they weren't going to have a significant uh, impact on a military's firepower. Because you're going to reduce the military's lethality by less than 10%, and there were other benefits, such as uh, not having large amounts of farmland in the country where the fighting was occurring, uh, to have mines in them. And demining could take decades and would have huge economic impacts and cost uh, a great many civilian lives. So the recommendation of the Red Cross was to get rid of landmines. However, there was a failure to show what landmines actually did. Landmines don't kill that many people. What they do is they cause fear because when forces make contact with minefields, they then try to avoid them by moving along their edge. Fast moving Soviet forces, tanks and armored personnel carriers, when they hit a minefield, either have the order to go through them, which is expensive, or to determine their contour and to rapidly move around them. So NATO used minefields not to kill, but to channel, to redirect. They would use them to push Soviet formations into different terrain, essentially large empty killing zones where NATO could optimize anti-tank and artillery forces against the Soviets. Essentially, they would take the Soviet force and try to turn it so that its flank would be more exposed because the flank of armored vehicles have thinner armor. So mines didn't destroy directly, rather they enhanced the killing ability of other branches. So the Red Cross's analysis was essentially too simple. It was not an integrated analysis. So you can see here Andy Marshall, who's on the top right, and he was very important at the Pentagon. He worked for DARPA and then Net Assessment. Because the weapons procurement cycle takes about 30 years, it's very important to anticipate what the enemy is going to be in the future and what their force structure is going to be. So Andy Marshall worked in the Department of Net Assessment and became the head of the Department of Net Assessment for over 30 years. And his job was to analyze what the enemy was doing and then to ensure the Pentagon was purchasing the weapons that fit the future battlefield. James M. Dunnigan was a military uh, soldier in Europe responsible for Redstone nuclear weapons and then he went into the commercial market of wargaming and he is the most prolific war game designer. 
in the uh, commercial world. And he started in the late 1960s and uh, had a company called SPI. You can see Dupuis in the uh, bottom right. And he's the author of the encyclopedia. And he was also involved in mathematical military analysis. This is a PMN Soviet landmine. So here you have another outcome of operational analysis. This shows the force effectiveness drops off faster than personnel losses. So you have numbers of persons that are casualties, in other words, injured and killed, but the force suffers its loss of strength faster. So if you suffer a 10% loss of soldiers, you're going to lose 20% of your effectiveness. That's what this chart shows, and it's important because sometimes the individuals that are killed are key personnel, and by losing them, the operation of the weapon system doesn't drop off by a third, but drops off by 50% or even 75% if that person's role was vital, such as targeting of the system and not simply reloading it. And you can see the impact is more severe on the attacker than it is the defender. This is a rather uh, busy and complicated chart showing division uh, casualty rates as a function of force ratio. D a division is a group of 15,000 soldiers. It's a standard uh, military organization. A casualty rate is the percentage of those soldiers that are uh, killed or injured in a given 24-hour period. And a uh, force ratio is the ratio of one military force uh, to another. So the way that you read this chart is you start at the uh, bottom horizontal line, which is the effective force ratio, and you first determine what is the ratio between forces. Now, the values here are extreme. It looks like these are ratios. You've got uh, 10, which means 10 to 1, 21, 31, 41, 51 ratios. And the values on the uh, vertical line are the percent casualties, which are the, the dependent variable, what you're trying to predict, and it's the percentage of losses that occur in a single day. So this is meant to examine a single U.S. division holding off against an enormous Soviet uh, attack by multiple divisions. So first you determine the effective force ratio. Let's say it's going to be 20 to 1. Then you determine what the posture is. And you've got two choices, whether you're the, in the attack or the defense. Now, the defense posture, uh, which is to the right, you're going to see uh, meeting engagement, hasty position, fortified position, prepared position, withdrawal or delay. A meeting engagement is when two forces encounter each other. Withdrawal is where you're pulling back. And a delay is where you're trying to slow deliberately their pursuit, which means you're going to be withdrawing less quickly. Hasty um, uh, uh, and prepared positions are is simply an escalation from a quick preparation by creating bunkers to um, a more extensive investment in terms of time and resources to build a defensive position. Uh, there's also on the upper left the attack of a fortified position, a prepared position, hasty posi defense, meeting engagement, delay and withdrawal. So in the second step, you determine what you're going to be doing. So we chose a effective force ratio of 20. We're going to do a defense in a meeting engagement. So what we do is we follow that black line from the meeting engagement down until it's above the 20 in effective force ratio. And then we look at what dashed line it concurs with. And it, uh, it intersects with the dashed line that uh, is percent casualty rates because we follow that dashed line up to where it terminates on the vertical line and terminates at 30. So that's how we interpret this chart. Right, so you get a lot of outputs of that kind of detailed information. Obviously the Americans were interested in how quickly their divisions were going to become destroyed uh, facing off in the initial stages of a Soviet attack in West Germany in the event that the Cold War uh, turned into a violent confrontation. So let's apply some of these two specific issues. There was a project uh, and an academic debate as well as a policy debate of measuring how much sufficient force was necessary in NATO. 
I mean, did NATO have enough soldiers to stop a Soviet invasion, or was NATO's military posture so weak that it was going to rely on nuclear weapons very early in an attack? Some of those uh, that debated this issue, and it was very broad and debated in a great many journals, but it included people like Trevor Dupuy, John Mearsheimer, Barry Posen, Joshua Epstein. And it started with defining a model of how the Soviets would win. And the logic was they would push across um, uh, Germany, uh, forcing NATO along a broad front until they achieved a breakthrough in one sector, probably 20 to 30 or 50 kilometers wide. And the second issue was on what the required force ratio was, force to space and force to force ratio, for the Soviets to be able to create this kind of breakthrough in one given narrow sector. So much of the academics centered around the three to one rule debate uh, and whether it was real and um, uh, whether it applied and uh, uh, to what extent uh, it mattered in this case. The third issue was over how NATO would measure itself compared to Warsaw Pact forces which um, most often uh, revolved around debates as to whether the armored division equivalent from the WeWove process was accurate. Now my general guess is that the models that were used were insensitive, uh, but it was a very important question. Here you can see uh, on the right a graphic of how the different echelons would have advanced from the Soviet forces, broken down by symbol of the different units. These are all battalions. Each battalion is about 500 to 1,000 soldiers. Uh, you don't need to know this uh, picture, but it just shows you that there was a specific sequence of groups that would attack um, with, with specified frontages. Now the map on the left shows the main corridors where the Soviets were likely to attack. You have the North German plain, which is the northernmost arrow, and it would have uh, pushed around Hanover. They couldn't have pushed farther north because there were too many very large rivers. Then there's the Göttingen corridor, um, which would have pushed directly across the highlands and the forests into the Ruhr. The North German plain uh, would have confronted the British at Hanover. The Göttingen corridor would have confronted the Germans in front of the Ruhr. The Fulda Gap was the line that was the closest between the East German border and the crossing of the Rhine. It would have gone through Frankfurt, which is where most of the Americans were deployed. Uh, and then there's the uh, Hof Corridor, um, which was a gap in the mountains uh, between East Germany and Czechoslovakia and West Germany. And it was of German concern. So all of these uh, axes of advance with their infrastructure were heavily modeled mathematically to see what local forces could do to deal the Soviets a delay in their advance. So this is a graphic representation of the different divisions advancing against each other with each division being an armored division equivalent and you can see the Soviets on the right side of the line have more forces than NATO on the west side of, 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 and the left side of the line and you can see that here there's an attempt at an overpowering breakthrough uh, in the center. So here is a chart showing the days of preparation and when combat begins and the an amount of armored division equivalents that are deployed from outside the region. You have uh, second and third echelon Soviet forces, essentially cadre units in the Soviet Union that when the mobilization is called up, the local conscripts arrive at the military base, they're given a quick training, put on a train, and they're driven out to East Germany. And you have NATO forces arriving by aircraft and ship in West Germany. So you can see the armored division equivalents increase, and you've got the number of days, and it shows the different force levels over time. Here again you can see the uh, armored division equivalents, and uh, these are estimates of how long it would take NATO to become defeated by looking uh, at the uh, outcome of the battle based upon the doctrine that this particular figure is representing. A second application is the Soviet invasion of Iran, which is always a concern for the Americans because of the uh, significant oil supplies in the Persian Gulf. Joshua Epstein designed a model, which is essentially a Lanchester model, uh, which added consideration for the role of aircraft to determine the best course of action in the event that the Soviets tried to conquer Iran in order to control Middle Eastern oil. So he worked out an Excel file-like combat calculation procedure uh, which looked at advanced rates and logistical constraints and air combat. 
Now, it's a very transparent model and therefore easy to understand, and he examined four possible cases. Now, his conclusion was that it was best for U.S. forces to confront the Soviets in Khuzestan after a long Soviet push across Iran, rather than to push north and fight the Soviets in the Tabriz Mountains. And so you can come up with specific tactical predictions uh, when you design these models that are a, a useful guide to policy. This is a map of Iran, the shaded areas are mountains, and Khuzestan is the province you can see around Avaz. It's the Arab populated segment of Iran. Here you can see the different cases. The Soviet attack option was either a direct drive from the USSR or a buildup in northern Iran and then a drive south. And then in each of the cases, uh, Epstein ran a model to see um, whether the US or the Soviets defend to see the outcome. And this is one of the conclusions. For case one, there's a battle in Khuzestan where you've got a Soviet direct drive and the Americans defend with the RDF, the Rapid Deployment Force. And you can see the WAV calculations here for both forces uh, as a measure. And you can see that the U.S. ground lethality, which is basically the firepower uh, of the U.S. forces, degrades less quickly than the Soviet degradation over time, even if the Soviets start off initially stronger than the U.S. This is a third application of operations research. This is from a, a, an analysis done way back in the 1990s as Poland was preparing to join NATO and the U.S. was interested in the burden that this would put on the U.S. in terms of resources they would have to commit to defend Poland from a hypothetical Russian invasion, which wasn't very likely in the uh, 1990s, but is um, more likely today. So the U.S. government contracted the RAND Corporation to use its integrated theater model, ITM, from its strategic assessment system, SAS, to examine alternatives and determine the least expensive effective force structure. So there were four policy options. The first one was to increase forces, in other words, to add more Polish divisions. And so the proposal was for Poland to double the number of land divisions from 10 to 23 to 26. Uh, but it was found that this would be threatening not only to the Soviet Union, but uh, to Russia, but also to its neighbors. The second option was to reconfigure the existing forces and distribute them over an area defense. In other words, do a defense in depth. This would consist of small semi-autonomous defensive units in depth, um, and it would require only four and two-thirds divisions. So it would be half the deployment uh, as Poland had during the Cold War. So it histor it's historically untested and technologically expensive because these groups would have to have armor and anti-tank systems and there'd be a loss of synchronization that you get when you have one big concentrated military force. The third option was uh, significantly improved defensive capabilities. In other words, a barrier defense with fortifications like the Maginot Line. This would take four divisions, uh, even a fewer force, uh, which is about 60,000 troops. So it's very expensive to build fortifications. The fourth option was uh, more reliance on air power and creation of an interdiction belt on the Polish-Russian uh, border uh, in which advancing Russian forces would be significantly degraded by altered infrastructure and local terrain. Uh, so you'd have choke points where NATO would rely on its air power, uh, but this uh, plan was very sensitive to weather. So the outcomes varied according to different variables in the model. So here you can see Poland and its location in Europe. Uh, ba basically sharing a border with Belarus, which was an ally of Russia at the time. This was a, a Polish strategic defense plan uh, immediately after uh, the end of the Cold War, which is sort of an autonomous plan. <clears throat> this is a proposed Russian invasion of Poland and what it would look like. Uh, here you can see an analysis of different forces, mechanized forces and aircraft and helicopters that uh, each side was estimated to have. And here you can see the uh, base forces that would have been available for an attack between the Polish and the Russians. And here you can see a breakdown in echelon of how the Soviets would advance across the border from uh, Belarus into Poland in the event of an attack and the confronting um, Polish defending forces. So uh, one, one part of the analysis was the uh, estimate of the effectiveness and looking at the uh, base case and how changes would occur if additional div uh, div divisions were added and whether or not the defensive line was breached 
and losses to both sides and the initial and subsequent uh, force ratio. Here you can see one of the scenarios where uh, you had 5,000 units with men portable anti-tank weapons in the zone in which the uh, Russians would cross into. Uh, and uh, uh, essentially what was thought was required for the scenario where you had the defense in depth. And again, you have an analysis of uh, when the conflict was stopped, was the main defense line breached, the force ratios, and the ground losses on both sides. Here you've got the uh, forward deployment of the defense. This is the barrier defense scenario. Again, more uh, analysis of when the conflict stops. This is, this is what operations research does. It'll give you these uh, estimates. And then you can refine the model to come up with more detailed values. So this is where the interdiction belt would occur for the uh, NATO aircraft uh, attacking advancing Soviet forces across the frontier. And again, more calculation of the effect on the end of the conflict, the losses, and what the barriers breached. And then you put the outcomes together on a chart to compare the cost versus whether it fits in with conventional forces Europe treaty requirements in uh, force levels and whether uh, it, it creates confidence politically and whether it's flexible and, and whether it's self-reliant. In other words, does it require other NATO forces to become involved? A fourth application is uh, off the topic of conventional war, but just to show you um, uh, how you can apply operations research to a conflict in the Himalayas. Here I came up with a model uh, of tactical nuclear weapons in the attack defense and against a logistical target to determine the effectiveness um, of nuclear weapons uh, against those targets. The context is a future Sino-Indian conflict in the foothills of Nepal. So this is a composite model. Uh, it uses the math from Epstein, particularly his Lanchester models using logistics and air power. It uses Posen for its piston model breakthroughs. It uses logistics and uh, estimates of weapon systems values from Dunnegan, which are then worked into a WeWeb model. And it uses parts of Dupuy's uh, uh, lethality index to calculate the effectiveness of individual weapons. So we have an air model, uh, uh, which comes from Dupuy and Epstein, a ground model, which is Dupuy and Epstein and Posen, and it shows attrition rates from a master Sino-Indian Excel file. Um, uh, and you'll see the, res the results of the, well, of the uh, movement, although I don't show the, the detailed results from the Excel file because they'd be sort of difficult to represent here. So this is the uh, map of the deployed land forces and showing their uh, general movement. You can see the battle area in the eastern portion of Nepal. And so this lets you know what the force ratio is at the point of concentration. These are the airfields that are proximate with uh, air assets that are able to influence the battlefield and the area around the battlefield in both uh, India and China. So this shows the general area of advance towards a Bharatnagar by the uh, Chinese advancing against the Indian who, Indians who are considered to be in the defense. Here you can see the logistical network and a proposed strike at various choke points which are habited zones and bridges across gorges. And you can then make the calculation of the impact on the logistical uh, uh, carrying capacity. Uh, here's an application of nuclear weapons with distance and the forces that are advancing through uh, the geography and from this we would make an estimate of the damage in the different postures both the defense and the attack. So this is a evaluation of the ground forces attack value using WeWove and Dunnegan's data for different types of organizations, infantry brigades, mountain brigades for India, special forces brigade, as well as for the People's Liberation Army China. So these values can then be compared uh, and a collapse value has also been calculated which, which is the point at which a unit suffers a, a significant morale degradation because of the losses in the organization. 
Uh, you can see the categories that you saw earlier for WeWove estimates of weapon systems. And here I've added on the far right the same estimates of attack and defense within the Himalayan areas. This is the breakdown of one of the units. You can imagine every unit has a similar chart where here you have the number times the effect weight offensive um, and defensive weight of weapons, which generates the different overall armor division equivalent value uh, for that unit. Here you've got those values for a PRC armored regiment, and again, it lists all the different weapon systems of that organization. So one of the questions that arises is how to conceptualize advances and retreats. How quickly can an attacker advance and what are the dynamics governing that posture? The solution is multiple internal optima. In other words, there, there are various preferred points for both the attacker and the defender, but then that results in an interplay of choices. So there's four dynamics in play. The first one is that, is that as the attacker advance accelerates, which we call velocity, it increases the enemy casualties by inflicting disorder. So by pushing against an enemy aggressively, they're going to panic. The second dynamic is as an attacker advances more slowly, they're able to make use of combined arms tactics, and this also increases enemy casualties. The third dynamic is as the defender withdraw slowly, it, this permits uh, combined arms tactics also, and this increases the attacker's casualties. And as the defender increases their withdrawal, essentially escaping, they reduce their own casualties in relationship to the enemy by reducing their level of contact. Now the model itself is fairly complicated. So you have a retreat which occurs when a defender's attrition rate has exceeded its defender attrition rate threshold, uh, which is DA and DAT. And the attacker's attrition rate has not exceeded its attacker attrition threshold. So we have to establish a threshold, which is what we think is the upper and lower, lower values for having attrition while they're in contact. The new defender attrition uh, rate, which is uh, uh, NDA, is equal uh, to the old defender's attrition times the proportion of the maximum withdrawal, where the maximum withdrawal is equal to the maximum withdrawal rate, which is a rate uh, subtracted from it is uh, a distance in broken terrain and 15 kilometers in clear terrain times the defender's power divided by the sum of the defender and attacker's power total. The new attrition rate is the product of the old attacker attrition rate and the proportion of maximum withdrawal. If there's a voluntary withdrawal, then the attrition rate must be recalculated using the new posture levels. So you can see here, this is the uh, nested if-then statement that would be applied in the Excel file in order to make this calculation. The basic principle is if the defender suffers beyond a certain threshold of losses and the attacker does not, then the defender's losses are equal to the weighted ratio of the attacker and the defender's power ratio. So I think it's conceptualizing a fascinating problem. And this is one among many different solutions. And so students are encouraged to think up their own solutions and then to apply it on Excel. And it shows you that just about anything can be modeled uh, to uh, estimate a combat outcome. A very important issue is, of course, logistics and the effects of unsupply. A variable loss in use of ammunition, mobility, and fuel-dependent vehicles, and the absence of water, food, and medical supplies impact the sustainability of personnel and can reduce a unit's um, uh, non-lethal casualties. A People's Liberation Unit I calculated requires 30% as much supplies as an equivalent Soviet Union or 1,500 tons per division of a 10 to 15,000 soldiers per day because it's far less mechanized. So this is the uh, People's Liberation Army uh, equivalent divisions in tons of logistic requirements per day. And so if you're looking at whether they're in the offense or the defense or pursuit or reserve, they have a different requirement in terms of ammo, fuel, food, and spares. So uh, you can see how uh, the different postures create different requirements uh, for supply. So in general, the logistic demand in tons is equal to 1,500 tons per division on average. 
So the logistic supply in tons is calculated as the number of trucks times their load, whatever that load is, typically three tons, times their availability because trucks break down, times the hours in a day in which they're able to drive, which is limited by the number of drivers, times the number of uh, times of kilometers an hour, times uh, two and the distance uh, from the main depot in kilometers to the forward depot because the vehicle's got to get from where it's going to where it's going and back again. You can also make an estimate of the air resupply and drop and ferry by looking at the individual aircraft, uh, making an estimate of the passengers that each flight can carry over what distance, and then the tonnage it can carry uh, in tons.